Hello, thank you so much for joining us today for Finding Beauty in Data, the intersection of data and art. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen to give you a little bit more information um, about what the panel we're having today and a bit of more information about Padlet. So PIDLIT stands for Public Interest Data Literacy, and that is an initiative put on by Georgia State University Library. And we are, are focused on um, building public interest data literacy. And so that means expanding programs that promote data literacy for the public good and building a more diverse pipeline of students who are pursuing data-related careers. And we're doing that by focusing on reaching first-year students and underrepresented groups here at Georgia State University and partnering with other universities across the country. If you'd like to find out more about Padlet, uh, you can sign up for our email list, or if you're interested, if you're a student and are interested in joining our uh, Padlet student organization, you can um, fill out a form. We'll put this link in the chat as well. I also wanna let you know about an event that we're having next week, part of our data in the ATL series on housing and equity. We'll be discussing um, data challenges in the fight against homelessness. You can register for that event at that link or by going to padlet.gsu.edu and there's a box there that you can click to find out more information and register for that event as well. So today we have two wonderful panelists Dr. Natrice Gaskins and Gabrielle Merit. Um, I want to tell you a little bit more about them and show you some of their work before I let them introduce themselves more in depthly and we start the panel discussion. I also want to give uh, a reminder that you can put in your questions in either the Q&A function or in the chat. And we ask that you um, uh, are civil and have civil discourse in the chat to be kind to um, yourself and be kind to um, other folks as well. Uh, Dr. Natrice Gaskins actually got uh, her PhD here in Atlanta at Georgia Tech, and um, she's an Afrofuturist digital artist. Her work is going to be on display at the Smithsonian later this month. Uh, she's also the assistant director of the Leslie University's STEAM Learning Lab and author of Techno Vernacular Creativity and Innovation, Culturally, culturally relevant making inside and outside of the classroom. Um, if you are a GSU student, that book is available to all GSU students, staff, and faculty through the library. So you can um, read that as, as an ebook. And we'll be putting links to that as well in the chat. Dr. Natrice's work is, or sorry, Dr. Gaskin's work is very interesting. I want to show you a few. Um, snapshots of her work. So this is some of her work that is going to be in the Futures uh, exhibit in uh, at the Smithsonian. And so uh, Dr. Gaskin produces these beautiful uh, portraits using uh, algorithms and machine learning, which she'll talk more about uh, later in the panel. And then I had to show you these slides because they feature some Atlantans <laughs> and Georgians. And so we have um, Stacey Abrams and Outcast there on the, on the bottom. And so uh, if you want to find out more about her work or see more of her work, you can uh, check out um, Dr. Gaskins on Twitter or uh, her website. And again, these links will be put in the chat. Uh, Gabrielle Marit is a information designer and data illustrator. Uh, she started out as a scientist and a scientific journalist and is now a designer and we'll hear more about uh, her story um, in just a bit and she does really interesting work. Uh, some of her clients have been have included WeTransfer, the United Nations um, and UNICEF or just to name a few. Uh, much of um, Gabrielle's work involves different takes on basic you know data illustration so this i think is a really good example of incorporating this is would normally would just be a chart something that has shows more about the people behind the data and is more is more beautiful than a, a typical chart so here 
is another example of one of Gabrielle's data visualizations. And there are some even more interesting, interesting ones as well as uh, Gabrielle also does design that are is not data related and makes really interesting collages as seen at the bottom of this slide. So I'm going to stop sharing this so that way we can focus um, on both of you. So as we get started, I first want you to have a chance to introduce yourself and how you got into the work you're doing. So if you can tell us a little bit about um, how you got there and then also a little bit about the work that you have been doing. And I'll start with uh, Dr. Gaskins. Um, I don't know what time of day it is. It's here it's in the e um, afternoon. Um, so good day or good evening, wherever you're from. I am Dr. Natrice Gaskins. I am at Leslie University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I am the assistant director of the Leslie STEAM Learning Lab. Um, my mother was a computer programmer analyst. Um, I majored in visual arts in high school, so it was my art teacher who brought me into computer graphics um, in my senior year of high school, and then I majored in computer graphics in college. Um, so I've always been um, pushing pixels and um, painting with code, so to speak, but um, more recently I've, I've had opportunities to work with um, teachers and students, um, elementary school through high school, and basically um, trying to bridge art and data and robotics um, in ways that are relevant to the students so that they are engaged. And we're looking at targeting young people who are normally not in classes for robotics and computer science. So, um, and, and having some success there. Um, and so really my work, both my work in my research and scholarship and also in my art is trying to bring in communities and groups of people who normally would not be in discourse around things like machine learning or AI um, in terms of how I create my work, um, in, including how I create my art. Um, so I guess that's good for an introduction. Gabrielle? Yeah, um, hi everyone, very excited to be here and an honor to be talking uh, with you, Ashley and, and Dr. Gaskins today. Um, so I'm a former science fiction journalist turned designers, as Ashley told you. Um, and the way I got into data art slash data visualization is when I realized that a lot of a lot of the things I was writing could have been explained with images in a way faster, way better, and maybe way more interesting way, especially when it comes to science uh, insight and discoveries. Um, so, so slowly, very slowly, I made a switch from writing to designing. Um, and I think if you look at my work, you'll see that it's mainly focused on not just science, but also things like social issues, environment, climate change, um, anything that could really impact people's life uh, more than business insights. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it for me too. That's great, thank you. Um, I wanna start with Dr. Gaskins and particularly your, uh, your new book, um, The tech, uh, Techno Vernacular Creativity and Innovation, where you define Techno vernacular creativity, or TVC for short, <laughs> um, as innovations produced by ethnic groups that are often overlooked. Um, can you give us an example how combining data and art can highlight and encourage those innovations? Yes, I just, um, meaning today, posted an instructable that looks at how um, indigenous groups, it's, native, it's National Native of American Heritage Month. And so um, I did um, post up some Native American artists and indigenous um, artists and designers who use data in some way in their work. And usually it's around some kind of cultural artifact, um, making a bridge between the technology and their culture or technology and, and their community. And so um, the information that's provided usually in the form of storytelling or stories um, so it's the ways in which um, groups are interacting with those artifacts using technology that is of interest to me. Um, and so uh, that's kind of been, um, and I also see these artists and practitioners as kind of what I call value generators. So they're kind of generating value through the work that they make, not just value for themselves, but values for their culture and communities. And so it's a, a loop 
Um, so it loops comes from the artists out to the world, but then also back to their communities as, as opposed to extracting out information or appropriating um, content. It's a, a way to cycle in and bring in the community. So their works are examples of that. And so um, um, I, I Will Wilson is an artist that I actually know. He, um, back in uh, maybe five or six years ago, was collaborating with his Navajo community and particularly weavers. Um, embedding QR codes in um, textiles um, called eye dazzlers, and I use that as a basis for bringing in um, people, teachers in this case, to figure out ways to incorporate heritage and technology in art and math um, in their activities. Yes, I think I, uh, I think on your Twitter account recently you shared. Uh, these beautiful beaded earrings that were that are done to show the the graph changes. Uh, I also I want to ask another qu question about um, highlighting and combining data and art. How do you? I know that through through your work that you have. Um, really created space and used maker space. So allowing students to be creative in multiple ways. How is it that you can, that, that's so many disciplines. So how can you, how do you approach that? I feel like that would be overwhelming to many, to many instructors and many teachers, the, the potential of so many different opportunities that could come from that. So how yeah how do you how do you approach so, that and prepare for that? So for the instructables that I just posted um, between today and yesterday, um, the photos that are included in the instructable of both teachers and students doing some aspect of this project is uh, creating uh, embedding QR codes in um, a beaded uh, using a seed bead loom, which is something a kit like a small one to make a bracelet and embed the QR code there through weaving. Um, so there's pictures of uh, young people using technology to sort of, or using math and computation to recreate those designs from um, native cultures at, in a museum. And then there's in the same museum teachers who are taking it further by um, moving into the loom. And you can actually see them setting up the loom and using and sometimes partnering, partnering up to create these designs um, for their um, for their project. So it's something that. Uh, with tinkering and in this case making or fabricating is an important part of the process and so you could go up to the point where you don't have a loom and you can just use computation to uh, create like pixel art um, using google sheets and their students are learning conditional formatting so they're able to simulate those designs using pix you know, the, the spreadsheet uh, cells and learning how to create value in those cells using and those cells become colors um, so that's something that elementary school students can figure out as well as um, older students and older people. And then there's um, some of the software that people can use to simulate um, the designs as well that's also in the instructable. And then just on paper, using graph paper um, and just kind of um, introducing it that way. Um, these are all ways in which um, people can come at it from their different ways, whether they have a computer or not. Um, to do something in the end that is something that ties into a, a culture or into a community. That is so that is so cool. Um, I I'm really excited. Hopefully, we can share the link to the instructables uh, in our chat. Uh, I want to. I think it's in there. Back. I think it's put there. Oh, okay, awesome. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I want to I want to uh, turn to Gabrielle and. Um, so you mentioned that you were a you started out as a as a journalist covering science and then and trans transitioned into uh, the work that you're doing now. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you've learned during that transition and things that you wish that um, folks who were working with data or um, who are using data or interpreting data understood from that design perspective? Yeah, it's actually a very interesting question. I was, I remember when you sent me the question, I was like, that's actually a really interesting one. Um, I think one of the main, main point that we hear often, and I think most people know, but data viz people don't always know is that aesthetic is not about making things pretty only. There's a part of it that's obviously making things more, you know, 
more like, you know, nice to look at, but also it's about also clarity and of the message of the data um, and also accessibility. Um, because what we realize in design, what we teach us is, and in general in, in, in design is that this, we make things aesthetic, but we also make a point of making things very clear for the user. Uh, when it comes to web, when it comes to a lot of things, the colors are not just a way, for instance, to be like, okay, I'm going to use red because it's nice. Uh, it's also because we use this because it carries a meaning. So it helps the message of the data. Um, but also sometimes it comes down to accessibility in terms of just reading. Like, why would you use this font over this font? Maybe because it's an accessibility problem. What size do you use? How do you organize? Do you, do you need all those labels on your Y axis? Maybe you don't. And, and, and in design, we really learn, I think part of the thing we learn is tripping down as much as we can to see what, like keep only what's necessary to have a very clear message and helping to have this translation of the message towards people that may not be as data literate or as interested. Um, and I think a second point that I really didn't know as somebody who studies science, uh, I thought that everybody was interested in data. I really thought so. I thought everybody was interested in science. Like it was this natural thing. And then, you know, people in high school and whatnot were like fascinated by genetics the way I was. Um, and in design, what you realize when you already just in, like, you know, just, just talk to designers, most of them are not interested in science or data. They, it's not that they don't understand it. It's really just that they don't really see the point. Uh, it's purely just disregarded. Um, and what they teach you though, and what we can use as the diverse practitioner, practitioner is how we can use design to make things that people relate to and are interested in. Uh, and that's something I've tried to explain my work, which is how can I make an aesthetic that make people have emotions and feeling rather than just be like, here's the data and just figure it out. Or like, you should be interested in this because it, I care about it or because my research is interesting. Is how do we make it visually interesting and attractive to people so that people would stop in front of it just like they would stop in front of a really good advertising on TV. Um, and that's something that we taught in design that I think we could you know, use maybe more uh, in the, the that community of like reflecting on like the actual impact of colors, of the layout, of the title itself, like how do we title or, or, or the data visualization, uh, the language we use, because the academic language is very precise, but maybe it's not always adapted to the audience. And that's the kind of thing that we learn in design altogether, how we make a package that people, um, you know, respond to um, more than more than just like it's pretty and it's clear. That kind of brings me into another question um, in relation to to art and, and data visualizations is that we, many people argue, argue that art is, or good art will evoke emotion. And um, so I'm curious what you, what you want viewers to feel when they interact with your work and does it change depending on the work, the, you know, the piece that you're working on or are you, I mean, I feel like in some cases potentially you, that's not what you're concerned about. You're not concerned about the viewers you're making, if you're making the art for yourself or what goes into that. Um, I wanna, uh, I'll go to uh, Dr. Gaskins first about what, um, and what do you want viewers to feel when they interact with your art? And then um, after Dr. Gaskins, uh, Gabrielle. Um, sure, um, I have been doing a series of portraits I call the Gilded portrait series, and usually of people who've passed away, who have been of some inspiration to me or are notable in some ways to me, um, have some importance. And so um, I have a particular algorithm related uh, approach or style that um, I use to create these portraits and have gotten a lot of feedback, positive feedback on social media. And so in general, I get positive feedback. More recently, I uh, did a portrait of Michael K. Williams and put that on social media and it went viral. And so um, after it went viral, like on Instagram, my audience uh, tripled, no quadrupled um, and since that has happened. So now any other of the portraits in a, in a row um, tend to have a, 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 a bigger response than before. Um, but the, there's a kind of a, a historical, um, not just culture, but a history-based um, thing in computer graphics that's behind that. And it's around, um, so in computer graphics, there's something called subsurface scattering. 
and it allows light to penetrate uh, translucent objects like milk or marble and even skin. Um, and then it's like scatters, uh, you know, the light across the, the surface of the objects. And also when the interaction of the objects with other materials. And so it gives kind of like a glow effect um, that you'll see in like a 17th century painting, um, like Johannes um, Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring. It shows how light softens and glimmers on the face. Turns out that that well-known and well-used um, effect doesn't work as well for darker skin tones. And so what it does is it sort of washes it out, mutes it or dulls it, um, as opposed to um, something called specular reflection, which is called sh or shine. It gives darker uh, brown skin subjects uh, kind of uh, gives character and, and kind of brings um, features to the front. Um, and what I was doing with the Gilded series was exactly that. I was applying a layer of shine over the portraits and through the process of, of using um, image style transfer. And um, that's, I think, really creating very striking images that people were responding to. So it was experiments for me. Um, but on the other side, people were responding to it in a way that really uh, brought it to a broader audience. And so on one hand, there's the research and kind of computer science of it. But then there's also the way in which people see the work and it has some meaning to them. Um, and so I like those images and I make them and share them. But then there are people out there who don't even know it's digital. In some cases, they are not quite sure how it's made and ask questions like, how do you make it? And some people actually use, they find out what I use and try it themselves and then they'll share it on social media. So it's really created a, a kind of um, call, what I call call and response, uh, response from the audience as, a, as well as part of the process of the response of the actual computer or machine um, responding to the input that I give it. That's that's really that's really cool. It's really interesting. I I love how you are. I I know I looked at I've looked at people who shared your work and they're like this. Look at this painting, and they they they're not sure. And I think that that there, it just creates a very interesting conversation. And do you think that their responses change the way you continue to work, or is it? encouraging you or do you think it may influence like what your next subject might be or what you want to do your next portrait on it may influence the quality the style in terms of the type of styles that i use to generate i still look for new styles to um to use this uh, process for but also bring in that shine element now into some of these especially if they're um you know, not just celebrities, but notable people or people who normally just kind of get lost in the mix. Um, so it could be around hairstyles. It could be about, you know, a series of, of, of images around children who um, are Black girls or from other parts of the world. Um, and I really just want to elevate, kind of amplify the features that many times, just because of history, um, have not been looked at favorably using the machine learning to actually um, bring beauty to that. And also, you know, we've, uh, we've even worked with Black Joy. How do we ca use AI to um, create data that's about capturing Black Joy in Trinidad Carnival? We did that. So it's always kind of a, how can we use the technology in positive ways? Uh and Gabrielle, I want to uh, turn it back to you about how I know that for in some cases it's probably there is a lot of intent, like you talked to, discussed earlier about design and how you want things to be to be viewed. But can you tell us a little bit about um, how you want viewers to feel when they interact with your work? Yeah, I think I'm quite intentional about how I want people to feel, um, and it's actually part of my process is to think of that, to think of specifically, like Dr. Gaskin was saying, she wants to elevate, you know, the future that maybe have been hidden and then the beauty in people. Um, I think for me, it's more about whatever topic I'm addressing, I'm kind of curious to see, here's the data and here's how, kind of like how you should feel about it, like how upset you should feel or how joyful you should feel or how anxious you should feel, depending, and I try to, because what we realize when you look at literature around how people actually like 
visit data visualization? Like, how do they react to it? Often it's less related to the content of the data than the visual, how it's presented, the title. Like, they've, um, there's a really good research paper from Evan Peck uh, who kind of looked at, he went and interviewed people in, I think, the Midwest. And they asked the interview people and asked them to classify data visualization example by like the best one and the, and the worst one. And the results were all over the place because what they realized it's not about how pretty it is or how non-biased it is. It's really just down to like, uh, does it talk about something that concerns them in terms of topic? Uh, does it talk about their own state, like community and state? And I think we see that regularly. And when you look at COVID, for instance, it's one of the best example, I think, where communities that were least affected just care less. And I'm sorry to say that, but white people care less in general um, because they were less affected, less, you know, less issue with healthcare because of, you know, financial um, differences type of things. But I think there's the, this, you know, we have the fact that there's an emotion that relates to data visualization and the data we're introducing. So for me, it's really important to actually play on that and try to people to relate to that issue, even if it doesn't concern their own community, try to get them out of, I mean, try to get them us out of a little selfish world and kind of open their eyes to more. And because it's backed by data, like when you talk about, you know, racial equity, it's backed by data. It's not something, it's not an opinion. I don't know why we having a political opinion around it. There's just literal data showing, you know, all those, those differences in terms of how much people get, how much people are getting paid, uh, you know, how much access to healthcare. Like we have data on all those us, of disparities. And my trying to read nice people and having that. So I would usually, depending on the piece, I would actually identify what emotion I'm trying to play on because on um, what I think um, to try to play nice people, they human people, like collaborate. Because when we talk about you know, a bar chart often we don't see who's affected. You over there, we over there putting labels on like, you know, this is the bar chart on healthcare disparities between black, white people, indigenous, you know, Asian and Hispanic. And like, how do they look like? Are they, you know, like people tend to think of them on like this very conceptual and abstract idea instead of the person who's like, you know, the cashier down the street, your neighborhood your neighbors, like, and I think we should put back that human aspect and like provoke those emotion. And so that's really how I tend to work, depending on the piece and trying to find the little things that make people kind of relate to it and have some kind of emotion for each different issues that I'm addressing. I, um, I want to like follow, follow up on that about this. There's some there's work that you've talked done before and discussed empathy and in relation to data visualization. And so how do you, what are some strategies that you have for, for students who are maybe encountering data or working with data um, for the first time to help them avoid falling in these, in the pitfalls of ignoring the people behind the data? How do they make sure that they are, um, telling stories with data that are uh, understanding and invoke empathy with in, in the folks who are viewing or reading their stories? It's always difficult because the way we are introduced in studies, it's a very cold, even research papers, it's just text, black and white, you know, figures. Um, but I think, at least to me, and I think it's something that one of the database, um, quite big database person, he's called Ger Forbes, T-H-O-R-P-E. Um, he was talking about it recently about how he thinks, and I feel pretty much the same way, like we only messenger, like my work is not, I'm not the one voicing out opinion. Um, I'm actually not considering myself so much of an activist, even though people tend to. I feel like I'm, a, I'm like, I'm trying to just share a message that is voiced by those communities. You know, like, I think we need to pay attention to that. So if you're going to talk about a specific issue that doesn't affect you specifically, go get those testimonials from the people. And, you know, they're not always accessible. Sometimes you obviously have direct access. If I'm talking about, you know, maybe a woman and men disparities, it's easier. Like, I've, I know, I know and experience some of it, but I also want to gather more testimonial from others, whether you ask people around you, but also now with internet, you have access to communities. 
you can literally go and look up an association that works on that specific issue. So if you're talking about homelessness in Los Angeles, you are able to go and look at reports that are written by the people that not only study, but are in touch every day with those people, read testimonial, see how they feel, like how the experience actually feel like. Because we can't, I don't know, you know, like most of the time I don't know. And so I really want to make sure that the message is conveyed properly and I don't fully trust researchers to always know because they study data, not the emotional aspect of things. Um, so I think in general, and if you have the occasion like me, I'm lucky enough to work with nonprofit that directly work with those people. So sometimes I have the chance of like working with, you know, some people who are witnesses and want to testify and can give me that human aspect that I can integrate later in the visual. Um, so I think that's one way. And I think the second way in general, and that's, I think, something that we should always watch for as students, as people who work with data is just the political bias within the research. It's not because because it's been published somewhere legit, whether it's a university, you know, whether it's not because it's published or well written or it's good research that it's not biased. And I think we really need to pay attention to that and like learn more. And I would encourage everybody to take more classes in data equity um, because there's a lot even in the language we use on how we introduce certain things um, that could be improved and that we should probably watch for when we design. Thank you. Um, I want to I want to go back to uh, Dr. Gaskins. In your in your book, um, you also discuss the importance of remixing, and um, you've done some some really interesting remixes most recently. And I think Brian can uh, put it in the chat. I, I saw your remix of Little Nas X's album cover, uh, <laughs> which which is very which is very interesting and. Um, I has has so many elements in it. So hopefully, um, those who are uh, on who are attending the panel can also check check that link out. But can you tell us a little bit more about what you mean by uh, remixing and how that plays out in your work and uh, why it's important to the um, uh, te uh, techno vernacular creativity? Sure. Um... So when I talk about TV remixing, it's um, it's a practice, but it also is a mode. Um, it can also be a mode of learning. So you have people on the world, practitioners, artists, designers who remix artifacts from culture, like arts and crafts or intangible cultures like folklore, traditions and language, um, the natural elements like outside um, and technology. And then um, using those things um, there's something that um, Audrey Bennett coined heritage algorithms that are amenable to algorithmic design. And some of those artifacts have um, algorithms embedded sort of in them. And looking, and so this, the work, the book explores the connection between culture and computation to broaden the definition of information technology and to show how computation and social and, and specific cultural practices counter kind of these uh, uh, dominant or mainstream histories as a way to um, reconstruct identity, social identity, social position, and access to power. Um, there are equity questions such as who gets to create these algorithms, what they can do with, with them, um, and that faces teachers who are tasked with helping their students learn how to code, for example. Um, in the uh, instructable that was I mentioned before, there's a whole section on understanding QR codes and kind of how it was remixed by Native American and indigenous communities to sort of sustain a culture and to, to tell stories both of the past and of the present and maybe even the future. And so um, if you do, if you QR codes are basically have a pattern of pixels, they're like, um, you know, grid squares um, and the image is a direct graphical representation of the data it contains. So um, this idea of being able to, uh, to put in and embed in that um, and that uh, data from culture or data from um, um, society, or in this case, from your community, and put that in an actual traditional artwork um, or traditional um, craft um, is something that is very interesting to me and something that artists are actually doing. Um, so when I found that a lot of Native American artists were embedding QR codes, I realized they were remixing the QR code. Um, they were making a bridge between the QR code um, as a graphical representation of data and a traditional, conventional, algorithmically designed um, artifact such as a textile um, or even a quilt and, and really making and merging those two together um, and been doing that for years. And so um, 
the instructable talks about um, Will Wilson, but it also talks about Guillermo Burt, who does that with encoded textiles, um, and some other um, folks that are doing some really interesting things around crochet, but like using traditional um, uh, art, art and craft to design to create designs that are um, embedded with code is something that I think this kind of example of computational remixing. And uh, Gabrielle, this is probably, it's not maybe the same definition of, of remixing as Dr. Dr. Gaskin uses, but in, um, in the online database community, there's often this push to get people to help make database better. And so there's hashtag events like hashtag Makeover Monday and Tidy Tuesday, where um, data visualization folks will try to redo a redo a chart or redo some form of data visualization to make it better. And so in, in my head, like I kind of interpret that as a remix, like they they take something and change change it. Um, and also much of your work in a way is kind of remixing what we think of as traditional charts and graphs. And as someone who's made a lot of charts and graphs, trying to, how do you like break out of that traditional box? Like you, you know, you, we learned that a graph should look like a certain way. And so how do you um, al help allow yourself think outside of these, uh, these strict rules that you probably learned with when you're studying the sciences that this is, this is the type of graph, graph that you make when you do this. And this is what the journals expect you to have. How do you break out and create space for yourself to do that? Yeah, it's it, it's definitely a different uh, remixing idea. Um, but at the end of the day, it is it's interesting. So when it comes to those Tidy Tuesday and you know all those challenges that, especially playing the Tableau community, they have a lot of that. I just find them really fascinating. They're great exercise for the community to just try to see if there's a better way to present the data. Um, and if it's an alternative way that just works out well. So it's almost like a practical exercise for the community to like test things out, uh, which I think is really great, especially for people starting in database. Um, if they want to try out, you know, try that they've never used, if they want to see if the data, they can handle the data set. Um, so that's always a really interesting exercise and you see very, um, personal interpretation, but also creative interpretation of the same data set. And you can really see how thousands of people have completely different way of interpreting the data, even what they want to show. Because at the end of the day, when you have a data set, you can actually, there's often several way of interpreting it and the message is what's contained. So that whole exercise of remixing is, is very interesting. There's a thing to watch for here, though. Um, I always a bit careful when people grab data set and just make exercise out of it. Um, and I've seen that a lot in COVID when people just grab because we had data sets of COVID available. People would just try out the data with skill on literally data on human death. And that's kind of a to me, that's a very harmful practice and we should watch for that. So if we're going to remix anything, at least for fun, um, or for just to practice, I would argue that we should do that with data that are a bit lighter and not as harmful in general, like, because those have to be really careful. We have to be really careful with. Um, but the idea of remixing is so interesting in a design world in general, because when we talk about creativity uh, and my own creativity, a lot of people ask me that question, which is where do I find inspiration from? Why is it so different than what you've seen before? Uh, and it's really not. So the difference is that I'm integrating, I'm actually remixing art inspiration from a lot of the diverse world. So instead of finding inspiration in the database world, I'm actually looking for collage work artists, like the old school collage work artists and the modern artists um, in paintings. How do they use colors uh, in cinema movies? What color do they use to represent an atmosphere? You know, when you're watching, a, let's say, since it was a Halloween, a gore movie, it's dark, you can't see anything. Usually there's this moment where like everything is okay, so there's gonna be light everywhere. And when you're, you're supposed to be scared, there's gonna be this music that comes up and it's gonna be darker atmosphere. And that kind of elements, you can really remix that all together and make it a new piece, apply on data. Um, so that's kind of how I see data, I guess, in my work uh, in general. Um, and this is probably why I break the rules so often when it comes to the design rules that we, you were talking about. 
Um, and I think it's interesting because when Dr. Gaskin was talking about the traditional art and craft, I think a lot of the people that do crochet things, they also break the rules because they don't use Y and X axis because you can't, simply can't when you do a crochet thing. Um, and Stephanie Evergreen this morning was tweeting about that, about how she often erased the Y axis label because they're unnecessary in a lot of data viz work because the title is enough, for instance, and you don't need all those details. Um, and it really comes down to what's the message and how much do you really need to explain people what the message says and how much is it polluting the message? Um, so the rules are here for good reason, they're useful, um, but also you have to think about the audience and you know who are you actually talking to with your data? So if it's a general public, they're not gonna be interesting in the, you know, to be honest, in the like, you know, the P statistic of your piece or, you know, or the variation or like this outlier. They just want a very clear message interpretation with maybe annotation even. So you actually might add more text annotated on the line charts rather than on the Y axis with the values. Um, so it's really a question of reflecting on that, on who's your audience, how do you carry the message the best way? And then you make choices also artistically um, on just based on that. And I think we should not be afraid of breaking the rules uh, because every day we realize that despite having the best data is and the best data, people still don't have the right reaction. When we look at vaccine, when we look at COVID, the reaction of, I think, the US, but even my own, my home country, which is France, you, you, you can see how we've done, I think scientists have done a great job of like trying to find as much data as they can, trying to explain things to people. And despite having those perfect graphs, we still have the wrong answers. Um, so we kind of need to, I think us people who have a scientific background kind of reflect on that too and think about how well we have all those rules and are they really useful for people who are not scientists. Thank you. I really, I, I really think that you're both like emphasizing two really important parts. One that with remixing and about with traditional work that we're again with your with the concept of the tech uh, techno vernacular creativity that you're emphasizing work for of people who normally um, work is overshadowed and doesn't isn't isn't looked at. And I think that is a a wonderful way to highlight it and then also highlighting um, for some for someone who's not who's not a member of a community that usually that usually is overshadowed making sure that your work is highlighting and respecting um, folks that who who are often overlooked at the same time like both of those things are are very important um, it kind of pushes me into my my next question about your works and projects and how you choose uh, which projects you take on and um, who, so how do you choose which projects do you, that you take on? And then also um, who do you see your audience it as for your work? Um, and I'll go to um, Dr. Gaskins. Um, so what was the first question? Uh, how do you choose the projects that you take on? And um, then also I think I, you seize your audience. I think I kind of addressed it. You know, I have these experiments and, um, you know, it's just based on whatever I want to make. I think what people mistake on social media is that I'm making stuff for profit. I'm just making stuff. I'm not even trying to sell anything. I'm not trying, I'm not commissioned to do anything. I'm just making images um, or making projects, whether if they're sound based or not, um, and just sharing it because I, you know, maybe I think I want to see what people think, you know, I want to see if, you know, maybe I should keep going in this direction and just kind of very generally do that. Um, the audience kind of picks themselves that, you know, like with the, Mike, the Michael K. Williams portrait, um, people were following that I don't know. And, you know, people are following with different groups of people, um, people who are tech savvy, people who are not tech savvy at all. Um, there's a lot more people that are not tech savvy who started to follow and ask questions. Um, I really like the guy who, you know, if I post something from my iPhone snapshot, what's on my lock screen, he's like, well, look at mine. So he'll take, and I've been using Deep Dream and look what I did. So and inspired by what they saw and then try it themselves and then um, somehow use it for themselves. And so I like when people begin to adopt the tools um, that I'm using because um, I'm always curious about how they're doing it. And maybe this is their first time 
using something like this and understanding that they are using something that is in the umbrella of artificial intelligence. They are using um, something that is using data, um, a machine that analyzes and, and outputs data, um, something from data. Um, so it's very interesting to be able to do that using social media. But again, I'm not trying to be commissioned to do someone's mom or someone's wedding or someone's, that's not why I'm doing this and I get them all every day um, for Christmas. And of the holidays, especially now the holidays are coming around, I'm getting a lot more requests. I'm actually too busy to do a lot of commissions that I'm supposed to be doing as opposed to not just, you know, just the random ones. And so I'm really doing this as an ex uh, uh, exploration as a way of experimenting and, and, and pushing forward with um, a new kind of art form um, or a new kind of way of creating art um, that really I, that, I'm, that I like, that's, a build, that's building on what I already knew in computer graphics. That, that, that makes sense. I'm sure I can imagine that you've probably gotten a lot of requ requests. I mean, because your your portraits are so interesting, and um, that would be, I know that would be a wonderful gift for any <laughs> for for anyone. Um, uh, Gabrielle, I, can you tell us a bit about how you choose what projects you work on, and um, uh, also what who you think your audience audience is. Yeah, I'm in a bit of a different situation than Dr. Gaskin because I do get paid for it. <laughs> um, it didn't start that way, though. Um, so when I transitioned, obviously, like a lot of people who change job, you don't get a job that's the perfect job right away. So I actually started doing those kind of what I call data illustrations because they're more illustration than these, in my opinion. They're a bit of a mix. Um, I just did it because I believed in the message. It was as simple as that, to be honest. I just wanted it. It was an expression, kind of Dr. Gaskin is like expressing herself through her art. For me, it was an expression of what I believed in. And I was I, I thought that it was important in certain message and certain data sets would be more discussed. Um, so that's kind of how I started it. Um, and to be honest, I started on Instagram because I'm very I'm very much of a millennial. Um, and then it picked up and then it became a full time job. Although what you see on my social media is mainly non client work. Um, but you know, it's when it comes to the audience, it's always a bit hard to define because uh, it also depends a lot on your platform. Um, and so obviously, I think when it comes to my audience, it's a younger audience in general. It's definitely more for millennials. However, it touches, I've get answer. You know, I've got, you know, people talking to me about my work from any place. Uh, but I think in general, one of my clients was actually talking about his audience and I felt that was a great definition. They talked about how the audience were the intellectually curious from 18 to 40. And I thought that was kind of where my audience stands, meaning it is people who are naturally interested in facts and data. And, you know, it's not people who are fully, completely, you know, detached from it. I do think that I tend to gather those people that I want to know more about a topic. Um, but actually not so much scientists either or researchers because those won't actually usually very much dislike my work because I'm not respecting the rules. Um, so I get a lot of angry feedback from my scientist friend, from my, from my PhD friends about how my charts are not, you know, perfectly set for a scientific posture. Um, but I think anybody interested in learning could, could find my work interesting, I guess. Um, this is usually what I get from, from, from my audience. It's always hard to know with social yeah, you have some like data from, you know, Instagram and Twitter, but it's a bit difficult. Um, what I see from my clients side of things is that I usually get contacted because they are actually trying to reach out to that population. So it's going to be nonprofit. It's going to be um, scientific institute type of uh, audience. And they're trying to f to find a way to reach to the to reach out to this uh, intellectually curious population. That's not always, you know, people with PhDs. It's kind of like the everyday person. Um, and usually they're also trying to find um, people who are willing to listen about the issue we're trying to talk about. Uh, when it comes to the, it's actually really interesting. When it, when it comes to the, um, the way you can classify people when it comes to social change, you usually about any social issue, you usually talk about in, in a specific context, there's like your allies. So those ones we've heard of really a lot recently. Um, there's the resistors, which are those that are like absolutely against the issue, you know, the cause you're fighting for. And then you have the fence sitters, which are the people that are kind of standing at the edge of like, we don't know what to think about this subject. 
And I feel like that's kind of the audience I would like to talk to about like, you're not sure, here's some data, but you know, here's some information in data and maybe you can make up your mind afterwards. Uh, but at least you'll have the information in hand. Um, since we're, we're coming close on time, I want to make sure I get, um, we have students who are um, either watching this live or going to be watching this, the recording of it, and um, they want to, you know, know what they can do now as students. So uh, rewind some time. Imagine that you can take college classes again or that there are co any college classes that you would want to have taken. Um, or skills that you wish that you would have learned when you were a student. Um, can you uh, tell us about either classes that you wish you would have taken or classes that you think that students should be taking now, or maybe those classes don't exist, but you can tell us about what you think students should be focusing on now if they want to work in this you know, intersection of data and art. What, what is your advice to them? And let's uh, start with Dr. Gaskin. Um, uh, probably I don't really, because the technology I'm using just got developed in the last six years, I don't think there was a class that would have, that I already, that I had to take anyway. My major was computer graphics, so I did take computer programming, um, especially as an undergrad. And, um, I did, you know, mess around with a lot of different platforms and, and things. I had opportunity to do that because art was kind of the foundation for, I went to art colleges and studio fine arts degrees in computer graphics. So I don't think I would change. Um, if it had gone back, it wouldn't have existed. Um, what I do now didn't exist. So um, I think what I would say is I kind of stuck to the field, even though I came to it for me from um, in, late in high school, because I just didn't want to use computers at all. Um, and I definitely wanted to be a visual artist. But um, once I started to use the computer as a tool, um, it just continued the technology and the field just kept developing. And so I just stuck with it. So when it went into VR, I went there. When it went into AR, in terms of augmented reality, I went there. So um, I just kind of had to just stay on top of the technology as it develops and get in and figure it out, you know, maybe work with others and collaborate with others, but definitely just um, kind of stay on it and be vigilant about it. Um, and where it fits. Um, so not necessarily using um, technology just for the sake of it, but using it in ways that sort of fit my overall um, way that I do things, a way that I want to do things as an artist. So I wouldn't change, I wouldn't take a different class. I wouldn't, I just would say to stick with it is really kind of been my, and then find opportunities where I can continue to explore um, what's happening in the computer, in the, in the field, so to speak. So. I think that's a really good point about, um, although, you know, asking asking the question first, you know, what students might take now, just to remind them that they, they don't stop learning once they graduate. They still have opportunities exactly. to, to learn more and to, there's constantly, that's what's exciting about um, data and technology is that we're con it's constantly um, being created. We're expanding upon it. There's new things. And so, um, I think that the the fact that you have been staying on top of it and constantly, you know, learning new things is demonstrated in 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 your work and um, and also, I mean, the the fact that this the Smithsonian, you know, ha has selected you to to in their futures project that's uh, highlighting futures and and you know technology and and art. Uh, I think that's a great point and something that I hope our students take to heart. Um, Gabrielle, it looked like you had uh, cut out for a second, but it looks like you are back. Um, do you have uh, any advice for students on what you think that they should uh, take advantage of when they're students or what type of courses or um, skills they should be building upon? You know, it's funny because I have the exact same answer, meaning I think also, in my home country, the university system is different, meaning if you pick science, you have to do science. You don't get like you don't get to do anything else. And I wish I had this. Uh, I actually asked quite a bit and fought the university quite a bit on that to be like, why don't we have more language classes just to start with, uh, but also ethic classes and psychology classes. So you don't have a major minor in France uh, when you do science. And 
I think if I had any advice, that's that's the one. Just take whatever interests you. Um, so I know you have a major minor in in general, um, but you know if there's something that you're passionate about that has nothing to do with what you currently studying, just take the class. Just take it. You never know what would come out of it. I don't think I wasn't planning on. I didn't even know that data visualization was a thing when I went to study. Uh, science and when I went to design, I still didn't know. I knew about infographic, but not really what I would be up to. And I took drawing classing out of uni. I took psychology classes because I was really interested. And so that's mainly what I would encourage people to do. Just take things that interest you and maybe you'll find a place in between that allows you to gather all those information and knowledge you've you've had. And um, I think there's always a place for if you whatever you learn you're going to use it one day uh i really i really think that so don't drop something just because you don't see a direct application of it because often i think we have a very practical way of thinking of studying in uni where it needs to get your job at the end i think in the world we live in it's changing so fast that probably what you're studying today is going to be relevant in 10 years so you might just as well learn whatever you can and then keep learning afterwards and and you'll get a you'll be fine you'll have a job probably it might be completely different than from what you have i think my job also simply didn't exist 10 years ago uh, we didn't have dedicated data vis practitioner it wasn't really a thing it was either a designer or a science data analysis but there was no in between um, so take any classes that you want as long as it interests you I think both of those answers are great. And I think that, I mean, it emphasizes that if you, if you can be um, a critical learner and learn those like, critical thinking skills and also, um, you know, practice being creative, which I think is something that many students don't, um, unless they are going into, you know, a creativity field, they don't necessarily give themselves that opportunity. They are put there, you know, as, as you were mentioning, and as we got in the message in the chat, which is, I think related to uh, when we're when we learn at least for for data visualization from the science aspect that when you mentioned ignoring the y axis, uh, oh no, you can't do that. The y axis you need that needs to be labeled. You need to have everything clear. And so one, making sure that you are giving yourself these opportunities to be creative, taking classes that can help you um, uh, broaden your creativity and. Um, learning those practical skills, learning how to be a good learner, so that way you can continue um, your education and, and picking up new skills as, as even after you graduate, since this is a field that is constantly growing. Uh, maybe wanna... something what we can add maybe is just also question your education. It's not because you've been taught that something is right in school, that it is right 20 years later. I think we, we can all acknowledge that, you know, sometimes we learn things wrong. Um, so take what you can have critical thinking. Uh, for the y-axis question, I'll put the link in the chat to Stephanie Evergreen um, video about it because I think that might be better than me explaining it. Okay, thank you, thank you. I didn't know if we had time to to address the y-axis question. So, um, is there any anything else? Any uh, last minute points you want to make? Uh, thank you so much um, to, to the both of you for joining me for this panel. And thank you to our attendees and those who are who will be watching this as a recording. I want to uh, share uh, my screen for a bit just to give you, uh, again, uh, more details. So if you want to find out more about uh, not, uh, Dr. Natrice Gaskin's work or Gabrielle Marie's work, you can check them out on social media or, or their websites. And um, if you want to find out more about Padlet, uh, you can visit padlet.gsu.edu. Um, you can also sign up for uh, our email list, or if you're a student and want to join our uh, student organization, we also we have a form that you can fill out. Next Friday, we have another event coming up um, with our data in the ATL series, focusing on um, overcoming data challenges and the fight against homelessness. And so we'll be speaking to folks who are um, researching and working on homelessness issues here in uh, Metro Atlanta area, so you can register for that event. Um, as mentioned, you if there are many opportunities that you can take advantage at the university, be that actual um, courses or through at the university library, we have workshops um, on data visualizations, on uh, different data programming, how to use R, how to do 
web scraping, all sorts of um, great data skills and uh, workshops and resources. So be sure to check um, that out as well. Again, thank you so much for joining us. I hope that you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, Ashley. It was great to see you and great to meet you, Dr. Kaskin. Meet you. Bye. Bye.